the deal. Okay. This is very valuable. Uh, this is just a graph of uh, half value layers. How you plot it, not a big deal. Um, there are resolution limits. This is on a 512 by 512 pixel matrix, which is really low now. Um, but depending on how big your image identifier <coughs> is, the best you're going to get is maybe around, <coughs> oh, I don't know, two millimeters, two and a half, maybe a little less than two um, millimeters of resolution. That would be line pairs of high, re high resolution. Um, the difference between image intensification and digital is you know from your previous lectures when you go into mag mode for an image intensifier, what happens? The dose increases. Hmm? The patient dose increases. Patient dose goes up because you are taking light from a smaller area on the input surface, okay, and then your your sensing circuitry at the output is going, whoa, we don't have enough single signal, so it boosts that signal so it gets brighter. Okay, in digital, a lot of people walk away with the misconception that who cares? There is no light; it's electronic. Um, patient dose does go up a little bit. And I don't want to do this. I'm going to give you the black box explanation, okay? Otherwise, we have to go back a lecture and I have to give you about an hour's worth. The black box explanation is your typical digital detector for a fluoro piece of equipment is usually around, usually has somewhere between 150 and, 100 and 200 micron pixels. Okay, so if you consider one that's 40 by 40 centimeters, okay, so that's um, 2,000 pixels squared, so it's about 4 million pixels. On a 5 megapixel display, you don't have a problem, <coughs> okay? You've got 4 million pixels, you've got a monitor that can show you 5, so showing it one to one from a pixel point of view is easy. But as soon as you decide to do mag mode, <coughs> excuse me, on a digital fluoro, what happens? Now you're taking only the signal from a smaller section of that detector, but you're going to display it on that five megapixel display. So you've got maybe on a, if you go to a 12 inch field of view, 12 by 12, you're only going to have 2.3 megapixels on a 5 megapixel display. If you stretch that out to fill that whole display, what do you think it's going to look like? It's going to be a little bit blurry <coughs> and it's going to be re really light because now the signal for each part of that detector is being spread over multiple pixels on display. And the system knows that. The system knows what you're going to display it to, so it bumps that up a little bit to bring that, that signal from each one of those tran TFTs to where it needs to be. Okay? And as far as the rest of them, sometimes what they'll do is they'll, they'll what they call bin the uh, pixels around the edge, it'll add them together and only do full rep resolution in the middle. But that's how you get a small field of view displayed at full size on a, a monitor. One of the problems that we ran into was trying to convince surgeons, they wanted to put these huge 65 inch monitors in surgery because they said it's bigger, we can see it. Well, yeah, but so they display it and if you stand Oh, way back here someplace, it looks great. 
but they kept wanting to go up and find fine detail, and now they're actually seeing individual pixels, and they couldn't understand what the deal was. So in a digital system, matching what you're going to display the image on is really important. And you want to test that. In addition to the SMPTE pattern to make sure that your system is displaying grayscales that you can see, okay, you also want to look at resolution. So a six inch image intensifier should minimally resolve 30 to 35 mesh numbers. These are easy to make. They're just pieces of, of screen that have mesh of uh, so many mesh per linear inch, and you'll be, this will be part of the demo we do. Um, and you look at things like sharpness, resolution, and things like that. On an image intensifier, of course, what you see at the center and what you see at the edge are going to be very different because of what? You've got to deal with veiling glare, you've got to deal with barrel distortion, all the rest. Like this. This is what they call an S distortion. That basically shows that your, your image is being distorted by the magnetic field. And if you have a piece of metal in the fluoro field, like a, 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 a hip, artificial hip or knee, some piece of, of metal, you can get that. That also shows your image intensifier is not shielded correctly. If you're using it too close to an MR unit, you're going to get that. Um, you want to look at entrance skin dose. You want to look establish minimum detectable contrast. You want to look at low contrast resolution, optical density, and high contrast resolution. There are phantoms of every kind of design to show these types of things. This is a special one for cardiology. And you get to evaluate all sorts of different stuff. In a noiseless image, See how nice this is? You can see everything. However, if you have too much noise in the system, now you have problems. Okay? And you plot, you know what size the disks are, you know what level of contrast they are. You can actually make plots and come out with what they call a contrast detail phantom. Limiting spatial resolution of high contrast objects are independent of dose. Limiting contrast resolution of low contrast objects are strongly affected by dose. So now you can see what image quality you get as a function of, of dose. And what do we look for mostly in fluoro? We're looking mostly at low contrast resolution. One of the things that they should test for, by the way, they should be testing radiology residents during their residency to see what their ability for observing and detecting contrast differences are. I worked with the chief of radiology who was working with a very medically brilliant resident, but he could not perceive contrast differences. So he would look at an image and he couldn't see the clinical detail he needed to see. <coughs> Once it was pointed out to him, he knew exactly what it was, what it meant, and he knew all the, the, the medical history. He ultimately ended up leaving radiology and going into a different field. If you can't detect visually contrast, you're going to have a real problem. So you can test for that. Low contrast performance, we'll do this in our labs. You've got two rows of equally sized and shaped holes. Both holes are the same size can be seen in order. And you count them as one hole set. All fluoroscopic systems for this particular phantom we're going to use here should be able to image the two largest holes clearly. The third largest should be just barely visible. Typically, low contrast performance is performed semi-annually, generally. Now, the only frequency mandated by regulation <coughs> is the annual measurement of dose and the weekly measurement of fluoro MA and KADP by the state of California. Everything else should be done and is, should be done at the recommended frequencies. 
those frequencies change depending on whose documentation you're reading. American Association of Physicists and Medicine has their recommendations. Joint Commission has theirs. Uh, there's all sorts of speakers that you'll hear when you start going to meetings when you have to get your continuing education credits, and you'll hear all sorts of recommendations. Your facility has already set those up based on their quality assurance quality control program. Uh, I should have a way to look at computed and digital radiography. Uh, screen film, if you overexpose the patient, it's easy to see, right? Or if you underexpose. Underexposed is too light. Overexposed, it's black. Oops. In digital, they all look almost the same. And yet, take your standard dose here, and you have half of it, two and a half times, five times. What changes in your ability to resolve low contrast resolution? To get this, you're paying a price of five times the dose. That's why it's so important in a quality assurance program is to look at your EIs and your I's or your S's, depending on what system you use, it has a different factor, but looks at what your exposure for a particular study is. It's really important. Okay, because you can do this, and they're going to love this, but they don't need that. They can see what they need here, okay? And there are phantoms for doing that. Um, this is one of the types of phantoms you can use for looking at a, a digital fluoro unit. So you've got different thickness of steps, and you also have artificial bone. So you can look at um, the ability to look at contrast of bone, bone as a function of thickness. You can do the same thing with um, artificial blood in vessels. Um, so you can do subtraction. So there's a part of the phantom that's, that's clear and a part of the phantom that has um, contrast filled uh, vessels and you can subtract and then you can determine how well your system's performing. Is there too much noise? Is logarithmic conversion working correctly? It's the thing about in a film screen world, QA was a lot easier than it is in a digital world. In the digital world, you've got all these different types of performance indicators that are all computer based. And you can do a lot of different things and test a lot of different things. You can spend your a whole bunch of time testing. Um, and this is, you know, just an example. It's in, in your notes. Um, looking at uh, it's a numerical illustration of linear subtraction versus logarithmic subtraction. Just a different mathematical way of doing it, depending on what the physician wants to look for. You've got quantum model that you can evaluate uh, on mask subtracted images. So this has a relative exposure of one, exposure of four, 16. D is the same as C, but it's windowed to enhance contrast. So you can look at how well your window and leveling works. You can, look, you can evaluate the effect of scatter on contrast. You have low scatter in A, high scatter in B, um, and then the unsubtracted image is shown for comparison. You can look at lots of things. So image processing, and this is where QA is so important in the digital world, because the image processing you do assumes a properly calibrated acquisition and a properly calibrated display. Miscalibration of either can seriously degrade image quality. Degradation cannot and should not be corrected by changes in image processing parameters. You should go back and find out where the calibration is lacking and recalibrate. Recal okay? Display calibration is a critically important component of quality assurance for any digital radiography system. The importance of this is Everything from your eyes on is really important. I was at 
the biggest radiology meeting in the world is Radiologic Society of North America. They meet in Chicago the week after Thanksgiving every year. Uh, it's a true international meeting. Uh, last time I was there, they spoke, basically there were like 58 or 59 different languages spoken. The attendance was 55,000. And one of the interesting talks was from a physician who basically <coughs> gave his experience. He had a fluoro system he was very unhappy with. And he had a private practice, and he went through, he changed the x-ray tube. He had them change the image intensifier. Image intensifiers back for what he did were about sixty-five to hundred thousand dollars just for the image intensifier. X-ray tubes were about the same. He put in a lot of expensive work. He was about ready to buy a whole brand new room for close to eight hundred thousand dollars when one of his techs noticed that he was reading images like this. And she asked him, when did you last get your eyes checked? He went, he got his eyes checked. New pair of glasses. So for a $350, $400 pair of glasses, all of a sudden, all the problems that he saw in his equipment went away. <coughs> okay. It's one of the problems we sometimes have with physicians. They don't want to believe the problem is here. It's always the equipment. Be prepared. Calibration of display is really important. In a miscalibrated display, what does this patient look like to have? <coughs> what would you guess? Pneumonia. pneumonia? Yeah, that yeah. consolidation. Yeah, this looks like pneumonia to me. Guess what? Patient was totally nor normal. On a calibrated display, their chest looked normal. Okay? All has to do with how contrast is set and maintained. We don't use CRTs anymore, thankfully. Although, I'm sorry, they still make the best television sets because of Lambert's law. Because you can look at a cathode ray from any angle from zero through 180 and they're just as bright. Um, LCD doesn't quite work like that, but they've been around a long time, since 1888, invented by a botanist. Um, and it's, he noticed that that uh, cholesterol benzoate crystallized when it cooled. RCA did the first experimental LCD in 1968, and it's totally improved since then. <clears throat> I think everybody probably has an L LCD something in their house or apartment. Um, this is actually a micrograph of what LCDs look like. I'm not going to go through the the theory of how they work. There's a whole bunch of slides in here we're just going to go through. <laughs> but with the how the specific fan would be used for monitoring should be 6 to 10 inches, typically 9 inches of water in a plastic container or a Lucite Phantom 7 eighths, 7 8 inches of Lucite. Or you can use the 1.5 inch aluminum block measuring. This is for QC. This is not for the regulatory measuring of dose. Okay? That would be your weekly fluoro test. Um, these are recommended tests and frequency. Image quality, pass or fail. I believe in a digital room, the first image that should come up every day at the beginning of some particular shift is the symptom. It should come up on the monitor. You should be able to see everything that you need to see and then go on from there. It takes less than 30 seconds to do and it will save a whole lot of heartbreak. Image quality evaluation, a more detailed test, you could, if you're gonna do that, it would be monthly. Visual checklist, quarterly and after service. Actually, I'm a big believer in visual checking your room every time you walk in. Look for things like frayed cord. I think one of the students here point, pointed out in this front room that the way that the cable drape works is not really good and it's, it's starting to tear in some spots. That's something you, you look at and you report. High level control check, maybe every quarter. Medical physicist survey is annual. So all sorts of checklists. Um, you can do a visual checklist performed quarterly. Um, grid QC, what's the consequence of having the grid out of alignment? What grid, are you gonna do? Grid cutoff. You oh. get cut off, 
you're going to increase patient dose. If it's not aligned correctly, you're going to get a distortion. You're going to have an image that isn't right. Collimation should automatically adjust when the SID is changed. That's a required tracking, and we'll see that in the back. You put a phantom in, as you raise the image intensifier up and down, collimator should open and close automatically to maintain alignment with the image intensifier. And that's a visual check. You can look at dead man switches. Anybody know um, what the requirement is for your exposure switches for x-ray rooms? You're behind a control bit barrier when you make x-rays, right? Right. Can you take that exposure switch out and go around the edge? Illegal. If you can make an exposure from outside that operator's booth, where you're in direct line of sight with the patient, which is a source of scatter, that's illegal. And the state, when they come through, checks that and they'll cite for that. You need to be able to make an exposure from behind the glass and need to be able to communicate with the patient. Okay, those are regulatory requirements. Uh, anyway, so every time you use a room, you're gonna sense this. You're gonna know if the table and image intensifier move smoothly or not. You're gonna know if the locks and detents work. You're gonna look about all of these things. Everything that's on here, you're gonna use every single day. And when they don't work, what do you do? Report it. You report it. You want to always let folks know when something isn't right because what is kind of hard to move today can break tomorrow. And then you're out of room. Okay. Got annual uh, fluoro QC tests. You got look at collimations. QC testing should be performed and documented at least annually. <coughs> Lead aprons, gloves, collars, and glasses need to be evaluated under Joint Commission every single year. Hospitals are required to have a method for identifying lead apparel, monitoring it, tracking it, and verifying that it's been tested at least once a year, and they have protocols in place that specify when does that apparel get taken out of service. Okay. You've got a physicist sur survey date and all the things that a physicist might check. Okay. <coughs> Semi-annual, usually it's suggested automatic brightness control tracking. Okay. High contrast resolution, low contrast resolution, mm -hmm. and source to tabletop distance. I personally disagree with this one in what? 33 years as a physicist, I never saw a source to tabletop distance change. Once the equipment's installed and verified at acceptance, it's a, it, it's, it's, it's a hard fix. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't change, but they still check it. State likes it. You can have a quality control review form. Should meet hopefully at least once a year or so, and look at this and say, is your quality being maintained at the desired level? What's your repeat rate? Are changes addressed when necessary? Usually this is done through the Radiation Safety Committee. Is your x-ray technique chart up to date? Now, Hell no. <laughs> how many here have a technique chart in their facility? They suck. Yeah, well. So, this is something you get nailed with with the state all the time. And what I told the state was, in a digital room like what we have here, you've got anatomic programming, right? That's a technique, because it allows you to choose exam, patient size, all of that. It's all there. Where you need a technique chart is what? Mobiles. So your facility should be able to show you, or at least show an inspector, what the standard technique is for the procedures that are being performed on mobile x-ray equipment. So you need to check that every once in a while, see if it's up to date. Um, you can forget this one, no screen film anymore. 
do you meet the required or established qualifications? What's funny is every state inspection, they come through, they want to look at your personnel records. They want to look at your certificate. They want to look at your venipuncture. They want to look at your continuing ed. My, you're going to be asked for that documentation when you go to work. Pay very close attention to what I'm going to say. Do not, under any circumstances, give the facility an original of anything. Ever. Keep it away someplace safe because if they lose it and you gave them the original, you've got a problem. Okay? And they do get lost. Give them copies. They, they will actually, for your certificate, most facilities will take what they call primary source verification, which means they go to the state of California site and they look up and they, they look up your name and they'll look to see if you're, if you're current or not. And the state accepts that. Okay. Um, based on QC trends, uh, do any procedures, practices, equipment need to be modified? Do they need to be changed or updated? Are personnel adequately performing assigned tasks? Are patient and personnel radiation exposure as low as reasonably achievable compared to national data? The state loves going through film badge records. I never liked it much myself, but then I was looking at anywhere between five and 6,000 dosimeter results a month. Um, but you need to have something in place that says, at what point do you get a little note saying you're too high? or you're going to exceed your 5R this year. And I, do have, I did have a radiologist that would exceed that. Uh, we're gonna pass the LCDs, blah, 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 okay, blah, blah, blah. Display characteristics. Every display has a characteristic curve, the inherent display function of a display system, and it describes luminance, versus digital driving level. That's the signal coming into the display, like this one, that says this is how bright that pixel is going to be. Contrast sensitivity is the sensitivity of an average human observer to changes of luminance in a standard target. You've got a contrast threshold, digital driving levels, display functions. You're not going to have to remember the specifics. This is to point out what gets measured to determine if your display is working correctly. This is all from DICOM, which is a diagnostic standard and they, it's what they call the grayscale, grayscale display function established by DICOM, which is a regulatory, or I'd say standards group, which basically tells you how to test, maintain, correct image quality on your digital displays. So there's something called a lookup table. So there's a, a piece of memory between video memory and display. It performs transformations of one set of pixel values into another set of pixel values. So this is what comes in from the digital detector. And then those have to be converted into a set of pixel values for your display. And it's during that conversion that we have to test to make sure that it's doing it right. Kind of, kind of like that. So, a display has its own native display response curve, and a lot of them look like this. So, what the lookup table has to do is say, well, we have to put in the opposing equal curve down here, and when you add the curves together, you get a straight line linear, which is what your digital system is supposed to be. And then you, you know, you've got 8-bit to 8-bit. I'm not going to go into that. That's way beyond. Mm -hmm. This is the DICOM grayscale standard display function. Notice that at the low end, the black, okay, um, You have, you have, okay, up at the white end, okay, it doesn't take too much of a difference to make a huge jump in your 
luminance. So the grayscale display function says we need to accept, accentuate down in here, and we need to tamp these down a little bit so that you can see the whites and you can see the blacks and the grays as well. Barton described how the human visual system works and how we, do, how we sense contrast. And we look at, we know what's visible by the human eye at given levels of luminance, and that's how that curve came into being. So there's smaller contrast differences can be seen at lower luminance levels. So in the blacks and the grays, a very small luminance difference will show up as contrast that you can see, okay? And then what the DICOM curve is, it's quote, perceptually li linearized, meaning that the same range of just notable differences on the x-axis is translated to a similar perception. Basically, that means you can see the full range of whites and blacks and grays. That's what that means. It's a simple test to do, some complicated equipment, but this should definitely be done at least once a year for every display that a technologist uses to look at images, a display, every display a radiologist uses to look at things, and for mammography, doing this once a year is required by federal law. 